All right. Well, open your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Genesis, chapter 1. This morning, we're going to have uh, kind of begin a new series, and it's the new year, and uh, we have kind of a new theme in mind, and the theme for this year is just Growth 2020. The goal is, is that we want to grow. We want to do better than we did last year, right? I think, uh, I would hope anyways, I would have a unanimous raise of hands when if I were to ask you how many of you want to be better this year than you were last year. I hope everybody would raise their hand. I hope everybody would hear an amen from at least a few people. A few of you Baptists out there might say, amen, preach it, pastor. We want to get better, don't we? There we go. We want to get better. We want to be somebody different, right? We've heard for a long time, oh, just be yourself, right? And uh, it, it's kind of passe, to be honest with you. We, want to, we, want to, we don't want to be ourselves. We want to be like Christ. And so that's going to require some growth in our lives. And what better time to start than a new year? I know for, uh, for me, I've, uh, I've, div- I've found a new app. How many of you, are in, how many of you like new apps? An APPS apps, like apps on your phone. I found this really neat app, and I just would encourage you to, to look at it, not here during service, but at any rate, uh, I'm sure all of you have your phones off. Anyway, uh, the, the app is called Toggle, T-O-G-G-L. It's kind of neat, really, and uh, when you click into this app, you, can, uh, you have this, uh, this neat uh, list of all of these currently used things that you're toggling. So, for instance, if you want to do more Bible reading, you might type in Bible reading, then there's a little play button down here, you hit play, and then when you're done hitting Bible reading, you hit stop, and it will, it will calculate for you how much Bible reading you've done. And if you want to do uh, more Bible memory, you might, talk, you might uh, type in there Bible memory, and then you come down here and you hit this little play button, and uh, you can actually uh, tabulate, it tabulates for you, how much Bible memory that you've been doing. If you want to do more exercise, well, we won't put that one in the app, but at any rate, if you want to do more exercise, you put an exercise, you hit the little play button when you go to exercise. Say you're going to jog or, or maybe you're, you consider exercise like cleaning your house, and, and so you want to just, you know, every time you clean your house, you hit the little play button and you add up your exercise, right? In, in mine, I have, uh, I have sermon preparation, and you can go there, and you can look, and, and there's a little chart that tells you how much you've done that day. So this morning, if you click on that, you will see that I have a certain amount of percentage because I did some finalized sermon prep this morning. And if you look in prayer, you will find that I, uh, there was some general prayer for about 35 minutes. And if you want to go to general reading, you can check out general reading, see how much reading you've been doing the last week. Now, what's really, what's really neat about this is it can show you where you're at. I like that because if you, if you can't monitor it, you can't manage it, right? So the goal is, is to monitor what you're doing so then next week, accumulatively, you have more. So if you, if you want to have more, more Bible reading and you look at your chart and you say, hey, actually, I, I declined. I, I didn't add more Bible reading. I actually declined in Bible reading. I, I declined in my Bible memory. I declined in my prayer. I declined in exercise. You can say, man, I'm just going the opposite direction of where I need to be, right? And so this is a real neat app to help kind of just cultivate growth in your life. And, and uh, it is a free app. I don't know anything much more about it, but it's kinda, it kind of it'll, it'll add up a calendar. You know how you put things on a calendar and then you never really get to it? Well, this actually puts it back on the calendar and, and shows you if, in fact, you are doing the things you put on your calendar to do. So that's pretty neat. And I'm a big chart guy and things, so it gives you all these charts. And, and uh, I would recommend something like that as you decide to grow in a certain, you know, in a certain behavior in your life. And, and so I want to grow, and I hope that you want to grow. I hope that this year is better than last year, right? And so last week, we talked about uh, basically three things. We talked about physical fitness, getting better in your physical fitness. We talked about getting better in your financial freedom. And we talked about getting better in your educational enlightenment, right? We want to grow in certain areas of our life. So what I've decided to do is I've titled this series, 
Growing with the Giants. And we're going to look at, uh, at a variety of men and women in the Scripture, and uh, we're going to see what we can learn from them. Because, hey, what better way to grow than to learn from the people who are doing it? Right? If you want to be a spiritual person, you learn from the people who are spiritual, right? We can not only learn what others do, but what others shouldn't do. I heard, uh, heard someone say this last week I, uh, that, there is, that there is not one lesson I've learned that I haven't learned the hard way, right? How many of us can amen that? Amen. Okay, right? We want to learn from other people's mistakes. I know Joshua has a book. And uh, he's got a book on jokes, so all of the jokes he tells are not necessarily original. Some of them are. And, uh, but he has this one, and it says something like this. Learn from the mistakes of others, because you won't live long enough to make them all yourself. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at some of the people throughout Scripture, kind of a study on personalities, biblical personalities, and, and see what it was they did to become giants. See what their, uh, uh, their successes were and see what their setbacks were. Uh, see where they had hatred issues and see where they had happiness issues. See, well, that's what we want to do. We want to look at other people and say, how can we model what it is they're doing? Now, the goal is not to necessarily be like them per se, but if they are a godly person, we want to do some of the things that they're doing, right? Because that way we'll resemble our Savior. Now, just a word of caution, I, I've never really gone through a, a, a study on biblical personalities, but it's exciting to me. I bought a, a big stack of books, and, uh, and I've kind of been reading through those a little bit, and, and uh, I'm excited to see what I can learn from others. How many of you are excited to see what you can learn from other people? I mean, I just, I want to learn, and, and what better way to learn than have someone teach us through them putting it on display, Right? A lot of things we, we learn are better, are better caught than taught, isn't it true? It's better caught than taught. So let's look at, uh, let's look at one person this morning. We're going to look at uh, somebody named Adam. If you have your Bibles and you're in Genesis chapter 1, if you're, matter of fact, if you are reading through your Bible systematically, most people start in Genesis at the beginning of the year, so hopefully by this time you're you're uh, pretty much all the way through the book of Genesis if you're a fast reader. If you're a little slower reader, maybe you're not through Genesis chapter 1 yet. There's a lot of meat here. But I want to read to you just a couple verses about Adam. So first point here is we're going to look at Adam's creation. Adam's creation in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 28. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all of the earth, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion, over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Now, when it comes to examining the potential growth of a specific person, of an individual in the Bible, I'm not sure that you have a better example than that of Adam. When you look at somebody who had tremendous potential, the potential to grow. Let's look real quickly at Adam's opportunity. At Adam's opportunity. First of all, he was created in the image of God. I mean, let's, if you were just to stop right there and examine this idea that Adam had the opportunity of a lifetime being created in the image of God. Now, when you get to Genesis chapter 5, the descendants of Adam were not created in the image of God, but they were created in the image of Adam. Now, that's interesting to me. Adam had a, a perfect father figure, if you will. He was created in the image of God. He was surrounded by perfect opportunities. 
Now, maybe some of us have had some really amazing opportunities in your life. And I know if you're anything like me, and, and I think many of you are, we've, we've actually had some really good opportunities. And when I look at Adam, I say, you couldn't have had a better opportunity than him. I mean, his surroundings, everything around him was perfect. I mean, he had a, he had a, 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 a perfect God, and, and all of the creation around him was all perfect, and, and he had these, these perfect uh, mountains and these, these perfect meadows and, and glens and, and gardens, and all manner of things was just perfect around him. Everything that was around him was perfect. Can you imagine having an opportunity like that? Not only being created in the image of God, but also being surrounded by perfection. Tremendous opportunity. He was in perfect physical health. Now, many of you woke up this morning, probably like me, and your, your back hurts, and your knees hurt, and you're, I'm having trouble with my shoulders lately, and, and my wrists, and my thumbs. Of all things, I have problems with my thumb, you know? I mean, seriously, you know? I mean, just all sorts of aches and pains, and, and Adam, though, he was, he was perfect. He was, he was created by a perfect being, perfect creator. He had perfect surroundings, was in perfect physical health. How about perfect mental health, right? I mean, I know the older I get, the more that I lose. It's just true. And there are times I ask myself, why did I say that? Why didn't I say this? And and, and am am I losing it, you know? I mean, how many of you have said that to yourself? Am am I I just losing it? And then you ask, like, what am I losing? Well, all of it. It's just all gone, you know? Perfect physical, perfect mental, and perfect spiritual Health. I mean, everything about him was perfect. He had the best opportunities. He had the best father, the best education, the best surrounding, the best responsibilities, and the best abilities. When I think about somebody who had an opportunity to grow, to increase, I, I, you cannot put someone in, in a better place than Adam. He had everything going his way. Adam's growth was, was really, it was imminent. It was, it was at any moment, Adam was going to, he was going to take off. Launching pad. He was, he was, on, the, he was on the cusp of, of excellent growth. So Adam had some opportunity, but Adam had two options. Let's look at Adam's options. And like Adam, we have two options. We have two options. Now, we may say that... Uh, that, oh, well, we, you know, they have all sorts of, all sorts of options. And, uh, but really, when, you come, when it comes down to it, Adam had two. He either could obey or he could disobey. Obedience to God or disobedience to God. There were no other options. God gave this commandment to Adam, and he could either obey or disobey. Now, in this regard, not much has changed in 6,000 years. Interestingly, a lot has changed in 6,000 years, uh, but this one thing has not changed. Either we can obey or we can disobey. Now, obedience brings growth. And when you look at, uh, when you look at all of these people we're going to study throughout Scripture, you're going to find one commonality, one common theme. Obedience brings growth. And disobedience brings death. That's the one common theme throughout all of these people that we're going to study within the next several months. And while we have many opportunities, we have two options, obedience, which brings growth, or disobedience, which brings death. Now, like Adam, this is wonderful. The choice is yours. You know, nobody has to make this choice for you. I know when we're when we're, uh, we have kids and, and uh, we, we, we make dinner, they, they really don't have a choice, you know? And uh, we, we put some food on their plate and we say, this is what it is. We, we very rarely give them a choice, I guess, when it comes to their dinner meal. We, we had some salmon the other day and, and we said, son, have some salmon. And, and so they eat salmon because they have no choice, right? But when it comes to obedience and disobedience, the two options that you have, the choice is yours, just like the choice was Adam's. I find, that, I find that really kind of comforting, isn't it? 
Like you have the ability to choose to grow or you have the ability to choose to die. And the choice is ours. When I look at our personal, my personal life, I can either choose to have success through obedience or I can choose to not have success through disobedience. Your goals, whether they're in your personal life or whether they're in your professional life, the goals and the choices are up to you whether you're going to succeed or fail. Just like they were up to Adam. He had his choice. So number one is Adam's creation. Number two, number two is Adam's command. Adam's command. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 to 17, it says this, And the Lord God commanded the man, this is Adam, saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Now, that's really uh, liberating, too. Can I just interject some commentary here? You, you can eat anything you want in this garden, right? Except for one thing in verse 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Let's look quickly, then, under Adam's command. A clear command. It was a clear command. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that God is clear with his commandments to us? He's not trying to trick us. He's not trying to make it difficult for us. I think some people, some people ask this question, well, why is it so difficult then? Well, because we've made it difficult. It's not difficult because God has made it difficult. It's difficult because we've made it difficult. We have chosen to disobey, which obviously brings difficulties, and we'll talk about that in a moment. You see, but Adam needed a choice. He needed to be able to make a choice because what glory would God have gotten if God had just mandated that Adam behave a certain way? He'd gotten no glory. This is the way God gets the glory. It's by allowing man to have what we call a free will and to be able to operate freely for us to choose him to either obey or to disobey. What we can learn from Adam here is that, is that we cease to grow when we do things that kill us. We cease to grow when we do things that kill us. And you say, well, that doesn't really apply because this isn't 6,000 years ago and this isn't a command made by God in the Garden of Eden. I get that. But we cease to grow when we do things that kill us. Now watch this. If we have some goals, if we want to be better than we were last year, and the goal is to increase, and we do things that make us decrease, we're no longer living, but we're dying. We're no longer growing anymore. So we have to not do the things that keep us from growing. We have to kind of get rid of those out of our lives, o obey and grow or disobey and die. And the command for Adam to Adam was simple. How many of us uh, have these clear commands at maybe at work, maybe, maybe with our children and, and uh the goal is not obscurity. The goal is not to make it difficult. The goal is, is to be able to communicate clearly to those people that you love, this is the command. And this was a very clear command. So we need to do the things that get us to where we want to be. So we see here we have a, a clear command. And then we have an unclear conscience. We have an unclear conscience. Now, the death that Adam experienced here was not a physical death. Uh, he, he didn't experience physical death until about 900 years later. He died and he was 930 years old. Can you imagine that? That's pretty good health. Now, I'm not sure my bones would, would make it that long, but, but, nonetheless, uh, but nonetheless, what he experienced was a spiritual death. At this very moment, he experienced this spiritual death. And when we disobey God, I think it's safe to say that we have chosen to, to separate ourselves from God disobedience brings separation from God. Disobedience brings separation from God. Now, as a church, as a church, when we set goals, we want to 
bring glory to God. We want to have, uh, we want to have a meaningful ministry, right? We want to do things that bring glory to God. So the goal that we should have should be glorification. And the way that we're going to glorify God is by allowing him to take part in the building of the church, right? We want God to build the church. That's what Matthew 16 says. He says that he will build the church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I want the Lord to build my home. The Bible says that unless the Lord build the home, the house, they labor in vain that build it. This is important. I want God to build the home. I want God to build the finances. I want God to build. I want him to be the architect. You see, it's really him that's building. It's me that's just at his, uh, kind of at his beck and call. I'm just the laborer. I'm just here to, to help, and I use that term loosely. I'm here to help God, right? I mean, what, what more can I offer him outside of my obedience? Here, Joe, carry this. You got it. I'm in. But at any time, he can say, you know what? I'm going to choose another person to help me carry it. Okay, well, then that's great, too. He can do it. We need to be obedient, and we need to glorify God, and we need to have a clear conscience. But here we see Adam had an unclear conscience. In Genesis 2.25, this is before they fell, before they were, and I say fall into sin so carelessly, don't I? Adam did not fall into sin. Adam chose sin. We, we, we fall into a pit. We trip over something we can't see. He chose sin. But this was before he chose sin. In Genesis 2.25, it says, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. They weren't ashamed of, of not having any clothes on. They were just very open between the two of them. After they sinned, after they sinned, in Genesis 3.9-10, it says, And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. We have a, a, a unclear conscience here, don't we? We have shame. We have shame that was brought on by disobedience. Shame is the result of an unclear conscience. It's the result of someone who's dying, not living. Can I encourage you this morning, my friends, that, that one of the greatest things that we can have for ourselves is a clear conscience? I mean, how many times do we go into a situation and, and we sin a sin and we have, we have an unclear conscience about it? You know, it's, it's that unclear conscience that, that maybe, maybe we are, are afraid that other people have seen what it was we were doing. Uh, years ago, years ago, I was... Uh, I was managing a property, and, and, and I didn't have these, you know, there's a couple hundred employees there. I wasn't really over them, but I, but I, was, I was friends with the owner, and it was, I was very close, and, and, and everybody kind of knew that, and they were afraid what I would say if I saw them. So anyways, I was always walking around the property and, and in this corporate setting, and, and there was this one guy, I love telling this story, there's this one guy, and uh, he went to, uh, to close his web browser really quickly, and it froze on him. And he, could, he clicked and clicked and clicked and clicked. And he's like, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, what, well, uh, yeah what, what do you need? And he's trying to like get, me, get, get him so, out of the sight of the, of the computer screen. There was nothing bad about it. I mean, it, 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 there was nothing on that web page. But he, was, he had an unclear conscience, didn't he? And he was burdened with shame and, and there, was, there was guilt. And one of the greatest things is when you can just say, hey, man, I'm an open book. How many of you have uh, had to delete web pages before or had to, had to uh, disguise something maybe in the financial records where you just didn't want people to quite see what it was you were doing? It, it's, it's the same essence when we are driving down the road and we see a white car with lights on the top and the first thing we do is we slam on the brake, right? You have an unclear conscience about it. Now, sometimes we're actually doing the speed limit, right? But, but it's... it's it's just so innate. You just do it automatically. You're just afraid that maybe you've done something wrong and you're scared. And so what's really interesting is when there is this shame, there's a lot of blame. Isn't that true? There's, there's enough blame to go around for everyone. When, when something happens in your life and, and there's guilt and there's shame and, 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 and you know you've done something wrong and it's really easy to, to pass the buck, isn't it? Say, 
Well, I, I was only speeding because, because, uh, because I, I, there was the car back there. It was the train's fault, right? It's always the train's fault for somebody being late. There, there doesn't even have to be a train track and it's the train's fault. It's just kind of like carte blanche. No matter what, it's a train's fault. Or, or it's, it's my husband's fault, right? Or how about this? It's my, it's my wife's fault. And friends, I got news for you. It isn't your wife's fault. It isn't your husband's fault. It's not your kid's fault. And, and sometimes we just have to own it, right? We got to say, hey, I did it. It's my bad. I blew it. I, I wish we could all just openly say that together. It's my fault. Can we do that? Let's say it together. Raise your hand. I want everybody to raise your hand. I want everybody to raise your hand. Come on, everybody raise your hand and say, uh, and three, it's my fault. Ready? One, two, three. It's my fault. Okay, one more time. Keep your hands up. Can't. This is exercise. Ready? On three. One, two, three. It's my fault. Okay. Now, some of you didn't say that. You raised your hand. You didn't say it. I don't know who you are, but I just didn't hear. didn't sound like a full auditorium. You know what? I get really good at saying it's my fault. You know what? What happens in the ministry is my fault. What happens in the home is my fault. It's not my kid's fault. It's not Dana's fault. It's my fault. And you know what happens when you get to this, to this Adam's, this, this command this, that was given to Adam? You know, what, you know what happened? He passed the buck, didn't he? Adam said, it was the woman you gave me. The woman said, it was the serpent you allowed in the garden. And the serpent said, it was God's fault. Like, nobody could just own this thing. You know what I mean? And when I think about growth this year, the reason you don't grow this year is your fault. It's not your boss's fault because he didn't pay you enough money. It's, 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 not, your, it's not your wife's fault because she didn't allow you to get another job. And so oftentimes when we do not reach our goals, we like to blame the other runners, right? Well, he cut me off at turn four. Well, the, the, the pressure in my tire was a little lower than it should have been. Or the, the weather just wasn't right for, for, for doing this sort of thing. Or, or, or whatever it might be, when you reach your goal, it's because you did well. But when you don't, it's everybody else's fault. Isn't that sad? There was a clear command, and then there was an unclear conscience. And when you sin, friends, there is an unclear conscience. And when you have an unclear conscience, it's easy to blame other people. It's easy to push it off and say, well, uh, you know, it wasn't my fault. Let's look thirdly, thirdly, at Adam's consequence. At Adam's consequence. There are several consequences for disobedience. Several consequences. There was a consequence for the woman. There was a consequence for the man. There was a consequence for the serpent. Now, here's what's interesting. There was a consequence for every generation that followed Adam. There was a consequence for his disobedience. Now, first, God blamed them all. But there is a consequence for what we do wrong. In Romans 5.12, it's a, just a one, powerful verse. Romans 5.12, it says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world. Who was that? That was Adam. And death by sin. And so death then what? Death, this, this uh, separation passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Sin entered the human race because of Adam. Here's what all men face. Separation. Not just a physical death, but a spiritual death, a spiritual separation. And this is important, that our sin affects other people. Our sin affects other people. And we have to be very, very careful just to own this sin and say, hey, this is my fault, and, and I will own this one. When we fail to do what's right in the sight of God, everyone gets hurt. There's not one person that's not touched by the sin of Adam. And if you think about it, you can probably remember a time in your life when what you did, the consequences of your sin affected other people. We say, well, maybe, maybe you did something that you, you uh, it was a, maybe one of these, uh, one of these uh, what do they call them, a white lie, right? Which I don't know, what is that? What is a white lie? You know, white lies still lie, you know? 
But it was a little white lie. It was, it was, it was okay. It was acceptable. And, uh, and maybe we don't see the direct consequence to that sin. But let me tell you what, if other people are hearing you tell enough white lies, quote, unquote, I tell you what, it's going to affect their behavior. And they're going to look at you and they're going to say, man, my daddy did it. And my daddy's daddy did it. And a little sin here isn't bad. But let me tell you what, a, a little leaven leaveneth a whole lump. And you got to be real careful because you let a little sin in and a big sin's following. What you do in moderation, your kids will do in excess. I've heard that for years. What you do in moderation, your kids will do in excess. So we have to be very, very careful of this. Our sin does affect other people, even if we do not think it does. I wonder if Adam thought his sin. I wonder if Adam thought his consequence for sin would play out for the next 6,000 years. Do you think he thought that? I don't know. But he violated a direct command, and it is our fault. Ecclesiastes 9.18, just a wonderful verse, and wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroyeth much good. How many times have we seen one sin by one leader, and it just destroys everything that fast? One sin destroys a lot of good. These churches, and I'm telling you, I've seen really, really big, big churches come crumbling down to nothing, Because one pastor committed a sin. One sinner destroyed all of the good that was happening in that situation. One person in a family who sins destroys the entire family. Uh, uh, Maybe a president who sins destroys the the United States. I mean, we see this time and time and time again. One sinner, Adam, destroyed a lot of good, didn't he? We could have been living in a utopia right now. What was he thinking anyway? You know what I mean? I mean, we look outside. This is no utopia, friends. This is Iowa. You know, we ain't in Kansas anymore. I mean, this is, this is, you know, about as close to hell as, no, it probably isn't, but hell's worse. Believe me, way worse. But here's what I'm saying. We could have been living in utopia right now. One sinner, one Adam, destroyed all the good. Had he had just obeyed the commandment of God. The the boundaries were like this little itty-bitty, you can can eat everything here, just don't don't eat this one right here. Just don't eat that, just that little one, just stay, just don't do that one thing. And that's the one thing he gravitates to, the one thing he goes to. When when you you look at, when you look at the, the, the progress of sin, and you look at exactly what happened. It was it, when when he was questioned, when when Eve was questioned, or when you know you see how this thing plays out. Well, she she first saw the fruit, and then she desired the fruit, and then she took of the fruit. And if we could just cut that thing out right in the right in the in the start of it, and just say, hey, let's just not even look on things that are not right. If I'm not looking on things that are not right, the, the chances of me desiring those things are going to be probably, you know, non-existent. So well, let me just give you just a quick application. What can we learn from giants like, uh, like Adam? Here's what we can learn. I think that although every opportunity to grow is stacked in our favor, although every opportunity is stacked in our favor, You are your worst enemy. You are your biggest obstacle. If we can just for a moment get beyond us, we'll be able to attain our goals. D.L. Moody, and I've used this quote before probably, but D.L. Moody said, I have never met a man that has given me as much trouble as myself. I have never met a man who has given me as much trouble as myself. As a matter of fact, all the trouble around me is created because of me. If I, listen, we want to arrive at the destination we choose. We want to set goals. We want to set big goals. We want to set these these monumental goals. We want to set monumental financial goals, physical goals, educational goals, whatever they might be. We we have professional, and and then we have personal goals, and and we have we have we have ministerial goals, and we have we want to set these lofty goals, and we want to try to get there. That's where we want to be. Want that's the destination. That's the target. Our biggest obstacle 
is right here. Right, everybody raise your hand. Let's do it. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Let's on three. What are we going to say? One, two, three. It's my fault, right? The reason we don't get to where we want to be is because of us. It's my fault. It's not your neighbor's fault. It's not the, you know, it's not the road construction. Maybe partly their fault, I suppose. <laughs> It's easy to pass the buck to someone else and say, well, the reason I didn't get to my goals was because I was held back. You held you back, and don't forget that. You can have every opportunity like Adam, and you can blow it big time. A wonderful picture of utopia, this kind of Edenic just wonder. I mean, you go there, you're in, the, you're in, you're in Eden. Everything is perfect. Every opportunity but the option you have to disobey is the one option that's going to cripple you. Listen to God set big goals and get out of his way. Let God do what he's really good at doing. You know what I mean? I mean, if you are the obstacle, remove the obstacle in a sense. You know what I mean? Just, just be yielding to God. Yield to God and say, Lord, whatever you want, I am going to do that. You say jump, Lord, I'm going to say how high. Matter of fact, I'm going to start jumping right now. And you say, okay, Lord, how high? How many times? How long do you want me to jump? I'm going to do whatever it is you want me to do. You'd be obedient to God. And in conclusion, let me just say this. Jesus was known as the last Adam. He was known as the last Adam. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 says, And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. You know what's interesting I find about this? Is the first Adam and the second Adam, Jesus Christ, both had an encounter with the devil. Two people. The same problem, completely different result. One of them was submitted to the will of the Father. He came not to do his own will, but to fulfill the will of God. And I tell you what, friends, if we do what God wants us to do, he guarantees us success. It's not about we hope so. It's about we know so. Obedience brings blessing. Just because you have opportunity doesn't mean you're going to do the right thing, though. Just because you have everything stacked in your favor, just like Adam did, does not mean that we are going to have success. Success comes when we obey what it is we're instructed, right? And it begins by the gospel. It begins by the gospel. I'm looking around the room. I think, I think everybody here is saved. Y'all are sinners, though. You know that. Y'all are sinners, and you all need some goals in your life. You need to set some big, 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 big goals. You need to set some goals. I don't care if you're if you're nine or if you're ninety. You got to set goals, lofty ones, huge ones, and then you got to trust God. You got to get out of His way. You are going to be your biggest obstacle. You want to save money this year? You want to save some money? Let me tell you what: the reason you fail is your fault. You want to get in better shape? Don't blame the Twinkie, brother. You ate that thing. Don't blame that. Don't blame your wife because she brought home the Twinkie. You made the money, maybe. She bought the Twinkie, but who ate it? You. Right? Don't blame the Twinkie factory. The Twinkie factory didn't do it. He, they didn't make you eat the Twinkie. Don't blame the marketing industry. Well, the, the billboards were just... Pervasive. I mean, everywhere I went, it's a Twinkie, you know? And I just gave in. I mean, my lusts were just overwhelmed for this Twinkie. I mean, how many of you want a Twinkie right now and gain 50 pounds and have diabetes? Yeah, all of you. Don't blame the billboards. Don't blame the manufacturer. Blame the consumer, the customer. That's you. When we don't reach our goals, when we don't win souls for the Lord, when we don't when we are not out there making disciples and preaching the gospel, don't blame the weather. Don't blame time. I didn't have enough time. Listen, we're all allocated the same amount of time, right? We all have 24 hours in a day. Don't blame me you didn't have time. We said, boy, I really wanted to save some extra money this year. Oh, I just didn't get around to it because I had my car break down. Don't blame your car. Don't blame your car. You should have done some, you should have done some maintenance on that car, right? Should have done some maintenance. Well, I didn't have money to do maintenance. Well, you should have gotten a better job. Well, I couldn't get a better job. Well, you could have gotten a better job. Matter of fact, I drive around, I see a lot of help wanted signs. 
right? The biggest obstacle is us. And until we own that, we'll never change. It's easy just to, just to pass that on to someone else and say, hey, I'm ashamed because I haven't reached my goal. I'm, asa- I'm ashamed. I have an unclear conscience, so it's easy just to push that on somebody. When you, get, when you stand before the Lord, let's put it this way. When you stand before the Lord, don't say, well, you know what? Nobody preached the gospel to me. Can I tell you, friends, that we have a responsibility to preach the gospel? The responsibility to, to tell people about what it takes in order to get to heaven and then how to live a good life that pleases the Lord and honors and glorifies him. Don't blame other people for your mistakes. So we need to own it. It's my fault. We need to do that. Friends, I believe everyone here is saved. I believe everyone here has trusted Christ. And so, friends, if, if you, this is my call to you this morning. This is, my, this is the call to action, Right? The call to action is this. You all know someone that isn't saved. You all know somebody who maybe has not trusted Christ as their Savior. You know, I had a, had a number up here. I want to say that, that uh, this week alone, there was almost, uh, I don't even know, almost 1,000 phone calls made. Is that about right, Joel? Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of phone calls. Just cold calling in the phone book. Open up the phone book. That's a good one right there. Hey, Debbie. This is so-and-so. This is, uh, this is Eric from Northside Baptist Church. I, I, I stepped in. I, was, I walked up behind him, and he, uh, he says, Happy Friday. This is Eric. How are you? And you could hear the voice on the other line, and he says it very kindly. He's very just very sincere. And Listen, uh, I just, I'm from a local church in town. just wanted to invite you out to our Sunday morning service. And Oh, well, that's so sweet, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, well, listen, I, would you mind if I could tell you a little bit more about our church, just 60 seconds? I'll keep it under 60 seconds. I think he went like 90 seconds probably. He's, he's going to make a good preacher probably. No, I'm kidding. Amen. And uh, I don't know. I just, it's our, it's our responsibility to, to tell people. You got to go, you got to know one person. If you don't know one, one person, I'm telling you, just pick up the phone book and just open blindly. Just go, I'm going to tell this person right here. I'm going to invite him out to church. God has given us an entire phone book. I mean, like, what planet does that work on? You know what I mean? Just we have an entire phone book. And just love on the people. Invite them out to church. Tell someone about the gospel this week. That's what I'm asking you to do. Would you do that? Would you do that? Let's, let's grow this year. Let's, let's grow the ministry. But let's grow the minister as well. That's you. That's you. You're the minister. You're the one who's doing the ministering for the ministry.